Matthew has certain buzzwords in his gospel. And behold, whenever you hear this, and behold, behold, behold. I've never been so beholden as I have been when I read Matthew's gospel. Behold, right? That's what you hear. And behold, there was a choir of great joy. And behold, okay? And the second piece, if you'll notice, Matthew, there's lots of wailing and gnashing of teeth in Matthew. Must have had a good dentist back then. So it was wailing and gnashing of teeth is another little thing in Matthew's gospel. So that if you closed your eyes and said, that's Matthew. That's Matthew. It's got to be. His primary concern, though, was to share and to share uh, the message uh, of Jesus. His primary concern was to share the message of Jesus. And in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, who is Jesus, in a sense? In Matthew's gospel, Jesus, from the beginning, the middle, and the end, was a teacher. He was teaching constantly, even still teaching in the temple precincts right before he died, still teaching. Tonight I'm going to share with you a couple of passages, maybe two, three. Um, they're not long ones, but they are passages that are particular to Matthew. So Matthew had his own material. And so it's particular to the Gospel of Matthew. And so we'll look at some of those passages tonight. But I'm going to invite you just to follow along, and I have a few notes that I, I um, jotted down uh, for you. And again, some of this I already said, but there we go. Consider the first written gospel initially. Distinctly Jewish Christian orientation from the very first page. So only Matthew and Luke have an infancy narrative. Okay? Only Matthew and Luke have an infancy narrative. Um, the claim of Hebrew or Aramaic composition for the instruction of Jewish Christians, it says, cannot be contained by textual evidence. And again, I took that from, um, I took that from uh, Fame Perkins. That's where I got it from. Um, some of the students at Silver Lake College actually went on to study with Fame Perkins and some others. <clears throat> the gospel is written in Greek, as were most of the evangelist sources. So it was written in Greek, not really Aramaic or Hebrew. It was written in Greek. Please understand, who quotes the Old Testament the most? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? You have 30 seconds. Good luck. Matthew, he quotes the prophets. He quotes the prophets the most. He quotes many things. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, as it is written, as it is written. Do you hear it? It's for his audience. It's for his audience. Every audience um, was different. And so he's very concerned that he's going to walk a fine line because he wants them to love Jesus. But he's going to tell the truth in his scriptures and its inspired word, but you can just hear it in what he does, okay? So, from beginning to end, Matthew's narrative shape. Now, I've often likened, oh, and one final thing. Um, I, well, I was gonna say, I've often likened Matthew's Gospel um, and the writer of Matthew's Gospel to J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter. And the reason I said I've likened it, I've likened it to that is because when she was writing on the train, she knew the end, and then so she started the beginning. And in, in Matthew's Gospel, um, it's no different. But we'll get there, and I think I said I shared this before. So the beginning and the end are connected. So <clears throat> he expands on Mark's Gospel. He has careful editing of Mark's narrative, but keeps the basic structure. Matthew revises and adds and expands. Not always, but he revises and adds and expands for text and things that he thinks that his audience needs to hear. 
is kind of difficult for us. Can you imagine what his table looked like? Okay. Matthew was popular. Matthew was popular. And so was John. Luke and Mark were not popular gospels. The most read gospel in the first centuries, and the most, and that's why it's Matthew. And that's why we go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because that was the most popular that was, that was around in its manuscript form and its other form. Everybody wanted Matthew. And then everybody wanted John. Notice, named after apostles, if you will. And so every one of these author, every one of these gospel writers had a good editor. They had a good editor, right? One time I asked a bishop or I asked somebody, I said, do you write your own stuff? You never want to ask a bishop that. Do you write your own stuff? And I think it was Bishop Wysislo, he said, no, I have a theologian who writes for me. And I went, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, I write an outline of what I want, but basically I have somebody flesh it out for me. Hmm. And I went, that's cool. That's kind of like a gospel writer who has a good editor and a good writer. Okay, that makes all the sense in the world. So he provides a fuller biographical shape, a genealogy, right? Isn't that great? You've heard the genealogy before. I love all those names, right? So-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. Birth stories, right? And so he focuses on a lot on, if Luke focuses on Mary, Matthew focuses a lot on, in the first two chapters, who did, who did uh, an angel appear to in a dream? Say it out loud. Joseph. And Matthew, remember, so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. And then there was Joseph, who is the son of, who, who with Mary gave birth to. Okay? Notice the focus. What I like to call, what I like to call uh, the Annunciation to Joseph. So that's the, that's the Matthean Annunciation. Because the angel appeared to Mary. This very, another angel, is it Gabriel, appeared to Joseph in a dream. Annunciation. God is announcing something to Joseph. Okay. Resurrection appearances. And sending the disciples on mission. I can't wait to get to that because that's the end of the gospel. Okay. That's really important, okay? In fact, before we do that, um, birth stories. And what did, he, what did the angel say? Okay, this child, right? Give birth to a son and you shall name him You shall name him, it starts with an E, which means God with us. Whew, remember that. Emmanuel, God with us. Anytime you see E-L, remember I said this too? E-L, Ael, means God. El Shaddai, El Elyon, God Almighty, God of the mountains. Sister Elise, Ael, Elise. Okay, we won't go there. I hope, she, I hope she watches this someday. All right. And then the sending of the disciples on mission. So there are five discourses all directed toward a Christian audience. And so Matthew's Gospel is divided into five-ish parts, major parts, and here they are. One, and we'll do this briefly. I won't yak at you all night, because there's something to watch. Sermon on the Mount. When we think of Sermon on the Mount, we really stop with Matthew 5, chapters, uh, verses 1 to 12 at the Beatitudes, and we say, yep, that's the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, I hope he had a drink of water because actually it comprises chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters long, 5 to 7. Amazing. And this is just a little tidbit. What explains the Beatitudes is Matthew 13, 16, salt and light. That's why it's next. Salt and light explains how to live the Beatitudes and who to be. Okay, I can't go there. 
that's cool so the Sermon on the Mount is key it's the foundation for all that follows and lived in the person of Jesus so that sets the context that sets the context and fulfills if you will I didn't say take the place of Ten Commandments it fulfills the Mosaic Covenant remember in Jesus is a new covenant and so that's what Matthew puts here in such a beautiful way okay in such a beautiful way so Sermon on the Mount a summary if you read those three chapters seriously if you read through them pray for a snowstorm no I mean if you read through them that's not so hard if you read through that those three chapters that sets the tone and the foundation for everything that's going to come Two instructions for the disciples on mission the instruction for the disciples on mission so look at that 10 1 to 11 1 that's good Otis reading sometime Otis reading our, our young our young people's group here our youth group um, it's revised and expanded content to serve the needs of the Christian community remember each evangelist Mark Matthew Luke John wrote to their community imagine that as a love letter from the Lord inspired by the Holy Spirit and that was written to each community and so Matthew revised and expanded what he found from Mark for his people he had them in mind okay they're suffering maybe it's all of that he had in mind stick to the lost sheep of the house of Israel get it Matthew edited out most of the journeys to Gentile territory found in Mark he edited it right out because his concern wasn't the Gentiles wasn't the north his concern was the children of Israel why have you come I have come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel so his audience said oh my we're special and they are and they, they were and they are Wow see once we know this it's each community and that's who he wrote to three parables about the kingdom parables about the kingdom of God he expands Mark's narrative and he pushes parables of not if the kingdom of God I need new glasses almost to the middle of the gospel so if Matthew has over 25 chapters if you take a look at that it's right to the middle and he continues to shape discourses to address the internal needs of his community if you keep that in mind that the Gospels are written to us they are but initially they were written to the needs of the community and the Holy Spirit understood that 2,000 years later the needs of Matthew's community and our needs would be similar and so he spoke in parables and I love parables because the word parabole um, is, is riddle and I just don't you like that when it's like our children when we were growing up stop talking to me in riddles <laughs> tell me what you're trying to say only once as I was growing up my sassiness I said figure it out <laughs> that wasn't pretty before during or after wasn't pretty Four, instructions for relationships among members of the communities you remember when he said it is mercy so it was about sin and forgiveness in abundance in Matthew most of the discourse concerns tensions that arise among Christians and so you almost read between the lines my grandmother's letter that I have at home is dated from 1964 it's interesting I've been rereading it because I'm sensing the tensions that they wouldn't tell me about when I was eight you know what I'm getting at Shh. David's listening they were wise to hide that from me 
there were tensions. That's not a bad thing. Are there tensions today? Yes. Does the gospel hold a healing balm for us today? Yes. Did it back then? Yes. And so Matthew knew the tensions. And so he addressed them with love and he addressed them and he found what Jesus, how, would, how did the Lord address what is happening? And so he chose and said, this is how the Lord is helping you. This is the, the moral life that you need to live. It was the motivation for healing, compassion for suffering people of God. Remember mercy from the very call of Matthew. It is mercy I desire, not sacrifice. Right from the Old Testament. There is Matthew. He sets that tone. But I wonder why Matthew would say that if he didn't feel and experience the mercy in his own life. And you know the things that we have gone through with our lives, we tend to focus and we tend to understand deeply what the Lord is saying. And we shake our heads and say, I get that. I know what mercy is. And you know, I preach this over and over again. We can't share what we don't have. And we're asked to share what we've been given. So if we've been shown mercy, no wonder Matthew in his gospel is saying, there's hope for you. Look at me. And he wanted me. So that's where he says, Jesus just does not withhold it. And then he tells the stories and is inspired to share. And no wonder Matthew understood mercy and healing and compassion. The instruction, by the way, um, Matthew, is also for those who are leaders within the early Christian community, and we'll see some of that, there is a warning for them. Be careful. Be careful. Don't become like the Pharisees and the scribes. Be careful. Don't be arrogant. 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 Don't be an hypocrites. Don't be a hypocrite or an actor in English. I know I've said that to you before. My grandma looked at me once and said, my little actor. And then I looked up the word when I got older and I took theology and I went, oh my gosh, hypocrites. It means, actor means hypocrite. <laughs> Uh-oh. I learned. He has warnings for those who lead the Christian community to stay close to Jesus and be like him. But he's not angry. He's not, mm, mm. But he'll say, woe to you, be careful. Because then you know what he's going to say? There's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, or grinding, depending. Five, parables and instructions about the judgment. And he expands the uh, apocalyptic prophecies of Mark, of Mark 13. And we're going to read a couple of those tonight. Each discourse is brought to conclusion with a reference of judgment. Look for it sometime. Take these notes and take a gander. Each of the sections, it concludes with a reference to judgment. If you don't show mercy, there's going to be wailing and grinding of teeth. So important. When I taught college, one college student, when I used this, he looked at me and he said, well, then, Father, that's simple. I said, what's simple? Well, pull out all your teeth. Don't you love college kids? I do. Can you imagine that? And I looked at them and I said, you're going to have yours someday. You wait when your teeth are all gone. Okay. What are the literary features of Matthew's narrative? He created new patterns in telling the story of Jesus. He made improvements. With each gospel, he made improvements with an eye on the people he was writing for. He avoids jumpy strings of episodes. That's Mark. That's Mark. Mark's got short little sentences. That's why I like Mark. The older I get, as my memory fades, Mark's my favorite. Actually, Luke is, but Mark's my favorite because he jumps around like I do. Reformulates introductions. He inserts the discourses to break up short series of episodes. He shortens and tightens up the stories. He modifies details and he corrects inaccuracies. Okay. He quotes the Old Testament more than any other evangelist. 
In Mark's Gospel, in Mark's Gospel, who asks to sit at the right and the left hand of Jesus? Who asks? I don't know. James and John. Who asks in Matthew's Gospel? Remember, Matthew can possibly allow James and John to ask that question. Who, who asked? Do you know? Who? No. Who asked? Well, that's easy. James and John, scholars figured they were like 17 and 19. No wonder John lived a long time. Okay? Who would you think they got to ask for them? Mother! So the mother of James and John comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, I have a favor. Yes. Can my boy sit at the right and on the left? And who does he talk to after that? Mama? Mm -mm. Fellas, can you drink my cup? Yes. No, you don't. That's like asking a baptismal couple, do you clearly understand what you're about to do? Yes. No, you don't. Only as I get older do I understand what Jesus asks in a profound way, okay? And so that's what Matthew does. He makes the boys look great. He just does. That's not a bad thing. Because remember who he's trying to, he's writing. And the disciples are the followers of Jesus. And at least in Matthew's gospel, slow but sure, they're getting it. Remember, Jesus is a teacher. And if they don't get it, what kind of teacher is he? I've given exams already that everybody flunked the last question. And I said, well, you kids, I'm cutting it out because the teacher wasn't so smart. That's why. What are the characters in the gospel? Inherits a cast of characters for Mark should be capitalized with some additions. Joseph, never mentioned in Mark. processing commander, right? You're like, oh, but, it, but it, your face is, it's wonderful. That's not a bad thing, it's just an is thing, right? Demons, they don't function as opponents because he's cutting out, Matthew cuts out, I think, all the good parts, but he cuts out all the, all the, he just cuts out what Mark puts, you know, the, uh, those who are possessed and those who are screaming and those who are getting all bloody. And Matthew's a little bit too sophisticated for that. He's not going to do that. So they really don't function as opponents. Okay? In Mark's gospel, it's exercising demons and, pre and healing. In Matthew's gospel, it's teaching. The crowd, the role is never physically pressing in on him, becoming dangerous only when riled up at the end. So the crowds are pushing on Jesus in Matthew's gospel. Pharisees are, are still the primary opponents. Why? Because they inhibited people to, who, from hearing Jesus' message. And so that's why Matthew paints them in that light. They inhibited people. Remember, the Pharisees only wanted them to grow closer to God, to the Lord. But they were a bit strict and stringent as to how they did that. Their intentions were correct. I said that once and I thought I would get stoned in class. Their intentions were correct but misguided. They spearheaded efforts to persecute uh, son, run them out of Dodge, a.k.a. Antioch. By the time Matthew's Gospel was written, the temple in Jerusalem had fallen in 70, Titus and Vespasian and all these lovely Romans. And so the diaspora began. And then people were starting to get kicked out of synagogues. Are you a believer in Jesus? Yes. Out. That's what was happening. Okay. John the Baptist, big, right? John the Baptist fills out the tradition. The disciples, he softens the rough edges of Mark 
Three passion predictions show a growing understanding on their part. For Jesus to be a teacher, the disciples have to be able to learn. As Paul Harvey would say, page three. Peter, as a spokesperson, was singled out. Deceased for 30 years by the time Matthew is written. So Peter has a dual function in Matthew's gospel. He's a link between the teaching of Jesus as is remembered and practiced in the church of Matthew's day and by Jesus himself. And he's an everyman figure possessing the weakness and strength any disciple may possess. I always like to say this at this particular point, not always, but this past year, somebody was pondering, somebody was pondering a call in their life and said, Father, I don't think that I can. I had Simon Peter in mind. Father, I don't think that I can fulfill this call. And went on to talk about his past. And I said, I had tears in my eyes, and I said, you are precisely who Jesus desires. And I think that's why he's calling you, is because you have room for him, and you understand, in a sense, Peter had weaknesses, but he also had great strength. And notice any disciple may possess this, any of us in this room, in the midst of the call. Well, finally, Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus as teacher from the beginning of his public ministry, and I've already said that, the portrayal of Jesus is more extensive, less ambiguous than in Mark. Their major notes of the infancy narrative are explicitly Christological. It's absolutely who is being born, the Son of God. Who is being born? It is Christ who is being born. The cross is not a contradiction to God's plan if the victim is God's suffering servant. Again, again, echoing, harking to Isaiah. Okay. Deuter second Isaiah or third, second, I think. Jesus' teaching is applicable to all the nations and not just to Israel. What does Jesus say at the end of the gospel? And I'll read that. It's a great passage. What does Jesus say? You know what he says. Go out to all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you and know that I am with you always unto the end of the age. Did you hear it? Know that I am with you. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. So the, infants, the, the passion narratives were written first. And only centuries later did the rest come into being. And so no wonder he is Emmanuel, God with us, because I am, I am, I am, I am who am, I am. If you watch Moses, I am with you, God with us. That's Matthew's bookend. That's Matthew's bookend. So the community implied in Matthew's narrative this is the only gospel in which the word church, ecclesia, occurs. What is today? Tuesday. I think that's Thursday's gospel. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church. It's the only time it occurs. It's the only gospel in which the word occurs. The evangelist has needs of established Christian communities in view when he composed the gospel, and I've, I've alluded to that. For Jesus, the principle must trump the rules. And that was against the Pharisees. Universal meaning attached to the final commission. Baptize all the nations. 
That's my favorite piece that I love to tell young couples that are having their children at any age, getting their children baptized. Teach them everything I have commanded you. I don't know who can do that. I can't do that. Know that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's how we do that. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. Matthew writes from a church that has recently made a difficult transition from being an all-Jewish movement to incorporating non-Jewish believers. Okay. Everyone will be judged according to their conduct. In Matthew's Gospel, conduct is really important. Conduct is important for everyone, for every member of the community, regardless of their station or stature. He warns that some Christian leaders may emulate the objectionable behavior of scribes and Pharisees. The gospel is also a corrective. The scriptures caution. The scriptures are filled with cautions for us. In other words, not to become too high. It doesn't matter, not high as a priest, high as a disciple. That's really, really important. The key is that the evangelist intended a significant turn toward the wider non-Jewish world in contradistinction to those scholars who still view Matthew as the Aramaic proto-first gospel. This view is widely popular by some in the 70s. Okay, last page. What I have is a handy little Here's Mark and Matthew and Luke all together. And I just wanted to have, give you this as a reference. There are many different ways, many scholars, they divide the Gospels in so many different ways, uh, please, and they just do. But here, um, there you are. If you look at the little note under the Gospel of Matthew in the box, this structure was not invented by modern scholars, but is indicated by Matthew himself, who at the end of the five discourses writes, when Jesus had finished saying these things, etc., etc. So when you look, that's just the internal structure of the gospel. Nothing, I don't want to say fancy, it's nothing that we need to, but Matthew determined that. Right? So Sermon on the Mount, missionary, parables, community, eschatological sermon. That's our concern for tonight. And there it is. Okay? That's Matthew. That's his structure. And I thought that you would appreciate seeing that. Just as a, as a, a point, a frame of reference. Well, just a couple of passages. Um, a couple of passages from Matthew. Um, the first one is Matthew 21 to 16. Matthew 21 to 16. Now these passages that I'm going to share with you are simply passages from Matthew alone. So this is his material. These are Matthews. You won't, there is nothing. I'll show you. So this is just Matthew. And this is, this is the character. Remember the word mercy. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner owner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon at about three o'clock, he did the same. At about five o'clock he went out, five o'clock he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing idly here all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go to the vineyard. So, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, 
and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, notice, isn't that delicious? The workers came, but he replied to one of them. So the squeaky wheel really does get the grease. Somebody must have been rather loud in the group who went, when? Hmm? And what does he say? Friend, friend, friend. I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Wow. Do you have a thought about that? A comment? A reaction? A reflection? Isn't that amazing? When you look at it, remember what I said? There's a warning. Be careful. The usual daily wage. The usual daily wage. Right? That's really important. The usual daily wage. This scripture has come home to me personally in my life when I and I think I mentioned this in public before when I gave a chat to some folks. And, and I said, I think I came into the vineyard about 2, 8, 2 p.m. It was to the priests of the Diocese of Covington. And they said, you would admit that at your age? <laughs> the older I get. I said, life changed for me. But I wonder what my daily wage will be since I'm not sure that I was there from dawn until about 2 p.m. And again, it touches me to say, oh my, he really is merciful. He really is merciful to give that. So I share that with you personally because I think it's incredibly important as I think about it in my life. Okay. These are all my favorites, by the way. I figure I can pick these out. I like them. Matthew 21, 28, 32, the parable of the two sons. This is, del ah, this is delicious. The parable of the two sons. I mean, I have a brother. You have two sons. D. So what do you think? Isn't that great? That's, that's one of the rare colloquialisms in Matthew. So, if you're from New York, so what do you think? I heard somebody in New York talk to me like that. You, and I went, are you from Trivers? So, what do you think? Oh, sorry, I love you. You're good. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go to the work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. <laughs> but later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he said, yes, sir, I go. He did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going to the kingdom of God ahead of you. Ouch. Ooh. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Ouch. Can you imagine? So what do you think? Well, the first one, well, I'm here to tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going to getting in the kingdom before you. We're getting closer, by the way, to the passion narrative because he's just kind of pulling all the stops. But do you hear the warning? You hear the warning. Be careful. And that's, that's the section. That's absolutely it. Okay? That's absolutely it. Did I... It, some of you that came, was it during Lent? Did I... Do I really want... Did I tell you one of my prostitute stories? Well, apparently not. Okay, but no, there's no better time than this one. 
um, because this is going to make this come alive. It's the only story I have. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, uh, especially I'm looking at the four wise ones in the back. Um, okay. Um, so I'm a first year theologian in Washington, D.C., and I'm down, I have a collar because I was assisting at private masses of bishops and cardinals um, in the hotel. And I got done and I got in a vehicle, my friend's vehicle, and I was waiting for him. I didn't tell you this? Oh dear. Well, this is being, oh dear. All right. So um, I'm sitting waiting and it's a big old boat, big old blue car, have my collar on, windows are open. I'm just thinking about what this was like, and all of a sudden, um, a prostitute jumps on the hood of my car. A lady, a young lady, jumped on the hood of my car. I shouldn't say prostitute, but yeah, well. But so she jumps on the hood of my car. Um, I, I don't know why. I don't, okay, so she jumps on the hood of my car, and she's she leans around and looks in the window at me and says. Well, before she says, I looked at her and I said, I'm tired. And she looked at me and said, I said, why are you here? And by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, you're like, it, it couldn't have been. I said, listen, purple fishnet stockings and Italian stiletto heels. Yes, yes. And I said, long before the movie Pretty Woman and Richard Gere and Julia Roberts, I said, what's your name? I'm 22 years old. I said, what's your name? I've never said her name out loud. Have I said, I don't think I said her name out loud, did I? I think it's Katie. She said, I'm Katie. I said, Katie, where are you from? She said, I'm from Iowa. I said, may I ask how old you are? Well, she looked at me and said, well, I'm older than you. And I went, <laughs> I said, okay, my name's David and I'm 22. She said, I'm 19. My name really is Katie. I said, why are you here? You should go home. Someone misses you. You should go home. And she just looked at me. I said, you should go home. There's a part of the story I've never told. Um, I said, you should go home. And so I said, I tell you what, now remember, I'm a theology student. I eat like a chicken leg once a day with rice. And I said, okay, I tell you what. I said, here's 10 bucks. She looked, her eyes got big as saucers. She looked at me and I said, this is the beginning of your train or bus fare home. Go to the phone booth. Yeah, I know. Go to the phone booth and call your parents. Call someone. You don't belong here. Because I see something really special in you. Go home. She got off of the hood of the car. I mean, very carefully. It, she, no wonder she kind of wobbled in the stilettos, and I thought, all right, you don't, you don't walk real well with those. And she just looked at me and said, you really care, don't you? And I said, I really do. Are you going to be one of those holy men? Please, that word is, that adjective is not used to me very often. Uh, certainly for not growing up. Um, I said, I really do. You want to go home? For some reason, this passage always has meaning to me. Tax collectors and prostitutes will be entering the kingdom of heaven before you. Wow. Amazing. I wonder what happened. I don't know. I was going to ask for a phone number, but then people would talk. Remember, I'm old, I can't help it. Okay.
a story for every occasion at my age. Parable of the Ten Bridesmaids, 25, 1 to 13. We're heading into the eschatological. We're heading into the eschatological. And by the way, the last story that I told, I have several more, but you're safe, not tonight. You're like, where did you go? I don't know. They all found me. Uh, Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are foolish. This is great. Don't you love? Matthew is, five of them are wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here's the bridegroom. Come to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and they trimmed their lamps, fired them up. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there won't be enough for you and us. You better go to the dealer and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids also came, saying, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, that's another beautiful Mathean, truly I tell you, right? Mm. Truly, when you hear that on the lips of Jesus, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour. All my life, excuse me, Deb, could I borrow some of your grace? I can't borrow grace. I can't use your grace to get to heaven. I can't. It, it's, it's, I can't. That's kind of what's here. I can't use your grace. Give us some of yours. Hey, Lord, I've been a good person. Look at her grace. Doesn't work that way. Notice the warning again. The warning to stay alert, to be ready. The warning, and not meanly, the warning. Finally. My all-time favorite. I'm not going to read the whole thing, I don't think, maybe. The Last Judgment, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. This is going to be read at my funeral. So it's got a special meaning to me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, notice angels. Matthew, Luke, angels. He will sit on his throne, the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the very kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked. I could finish this by heart. And you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Our members of my family, in this translation, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, I got to do the left hand. You that are cursed, depart from me to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? 
Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of these least, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Again, the great judgment, the great warning to not separate. Loving God and loving neighbor together are one. That is made clear in the first letter of John. To say that I love the Lord but hate my neighbor, what does John say? Who are we? We're nothing but a liar. So, can you imagine that? I mean, my, my, God loved John. He gets up and nothing but a liar. So Matthew's warning, warning again. Show mercy. Show mercy and see who Jesus is. There will always be somebody that's different, different than you can ever imagine. And that's why he used tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, these folks, the dregs of the world. I wonder what Jesus sees. Does he see like I see? Okay. That's, those are four different, four different Gospels. That's all Matthew. That's all. The, I gave you, at least they're my favorites, but I gave you the riches of some of the riches of Matthew's Gospel. And his intention is mercy. And you remember what it said, that whole universal call. I, I go out to all the nations. We hear it at the very end. Okay? Okay. Now, um, it is around this hour. And so I am, I, I, let me introduce this first. Um, how many here are familiar with The Chosen? Holy Moses. Okay. Have you ever seen The Chosen? So, we're going to see some excerpts from The Chosen, and this is Matthew. And so to those that are listening at home uh, on this live stream uh, evening, um, there is a link, I believe, that you can uh, find this pat these excerpts uh, later on. Obviously, for copyright, I'm going to be right out to it. Copyright, and for that purpose, um, we need to, I believe, stop the, the live stream. So to those that are departing, God bless you, love you very much. And here we go. And we're going to play this. This is Matthew and his dog. This is the call that we began with. That's his mother. over our heads, which is more than some people can say. You can ask me for money if you ever need it. How can you say that? It's quite common. I've seen many parents entirely dependent on your you. Your father would sooner die than take your blood money. I know you are ashamed of me, but your decision is irrational. Rome will continue to collect taxes no matter what. I'm skilled with numbers. Did you come here to justify yourself? <gasps> no! Things like sand in a flood. The things I thought I knew to be true. Are you in trouble? Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature? That cannot be explained? That is what people asked when you were a boy. 